the uh, evidence is everywhere. We live in interesting times. Some decade ago, a Leadership Institute donor, a very generous donor, told me that we really had to do something about the news media. Thank you very much, Corey. Now for an update on the campus leadership program. My pleasure to introduce to you Jamie LaRose. He graduated from Dickinson College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania in 1996 with the Bachelor of Arts in Public Policy and a minor in Economics. Prior to working here at the Institute, Jamie worked part-time as an assistant to the Director of Housing and Development for Senator Santorum's office uh, in Allentown, Pennsylvania, and in regional development for MCI WorldCom here in Arlington. He's been with the Institute for close to a year now, and um, a year and a half now, as events coordinator for the Campus Leadership Program. His major responsibilities are to help current CLP students organize events on their campuses. He graduated from several Leadership Institute schools, including the Youth Leadership School. Jamie? Good morning, everybody. Um, it's my responsibility today to give you all an update on the Campus Leadership Program. And before I get started on my specific position and what I actually do, I'd just like to give some examples and highlights of what the Campus Leadership Program has done, and basically just a brief overview of, of how we accomplished this. The Campus Leadership Program is the arm of the Institute that sets out to establish a conservative presence on college campuses nationwide. And as you might be thinking, this seems like a very daunting task, which it is. It is something that I'm sure nobody in this room would argue that's something that, that definitely needs to be done. The way we go about in doing this is we have 12 regional coordinators um, focused around the country in Florida, California, North Carolina, Texas, and locally here in the Arlington, Washington, D.C. region. They actually go out to these universities and set up recruitment tables and focus on students that are conservative and are interested in starting their own 501c3 groups on their particular campuses. One of the main reasons that we do this is to help these students obviously first <coughs> recruit new members for their groups and support their cause for whatever that may be. Um, one of the main ways we do this, and this is particularly with my position as events coordinator, is help them establish bringing speakers to campus or organizing several different types of events. When we came about to my position and how we wanted to do this, we thought of other organizations like Young America's Foundation and Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and we saw how they were doing it, basically bringing a lot of conservative speakers to their campus and helping the students gain notoriety in that manner. We wanted to focus on a little, in a little bit different aspect, and by doing that, we are encouraging students to have different types of events. We have worked with the National Rifle Association in hosting ski shoots in different parts of the country. Uh, we hosted one in North Carolina last semester, and it was very successful. We had about 40 students show up, some of which were not even involved in the group. They just wanted to come out and learn a little bit more about the program, and basically just have a, a fun day of, of shooting guns. We had some count local councilmen come out to the event, and uh, actually some people that were running for Congress, I believe, come out. And it was just a great way. It was a fun event, and it was a fun day, and it helped the students obviously gain new members and, and gain some notoriety for the group. Um, we've also hosted some barbecues on campuses, especially in, in the Missouri region. They were, again, very successful. And they're just a different aspect, a different way to get students organized and get their members enthused about their group and about whatever cause they may be supporting. Obviously, one of the main ways that students like to have events on campus is by bringing conservative speakers. We help them in several ways in this capacity. Um, I myself work as a basically a liaison between whatever speaker's scheduler and the students and help them make sure that everything is focused and the timing and dates and all those type of things are taken care of. Um, we've hosted several nationally con known conservative speakers on campus just this semester. We are right now at 30, 30 events hosted. And excuse me, let me backtrack one minute. I did want to touch on some of the things that we've done as a CLP organization. We have 209 active groups on college campuses nationwide right now. That is as of today. Um, the st most recently, we've taken over the, the Youth Leadership School, the flagship program here at the Leadership Institute, and that has trained, 
265 students as of today. And that is just for this semester alone. And we're planning on continuing that and growing that into the next semester as well. Um, did want to focus briefly on some of the problems that our students have had with their liberal administrations in hosting events. Most recently, Dan Flynn was scheduled the executive, executive director of Accuracy in Academia. He was scheduled to speak at the University of Pittsburgh next week. Um, the student went through all the proper channels, getting the room, um, publicizing the event. As of yesterday, they canceled the room on him with no reason, and now we're not going to be able to have the event because we cannot find a suitable room to host it in a short amount of time. Last year at the University of Michigan, our students there are focused on affirmative action. They attempted to bring in Linda Chavez. Again, the student went through all the proper channels, got the room, did the publicity, went through several organizations to get funding to host this event. The last minute, they canceled the room on them again, saying that they lost the application. And instead of giving them plenty of time to renew the application, they decided to tell them it's the last minute and we were not able to host the event. And these are just some, a few examples of the many problems that our students attempt to tackle when they're working to get conservative speakers on campus. But on the flip side, we have had several great events this semester and have generated a tremendous amount of publicity for our groups. Got a lot of there's a lot of local community members involved as well. Most recently, Dan Flynn again had a very successful event, depending on how you look at it, at the University of California in Berkeley. Um, they hosted over 400 people to the event. Several of them were protesters, but it was <laughs> we, we still got some notoriety for their group, and it, it did work out to be a very successful event it, until the end when they actually had to cut the microphone to get them to leave the stage. But up until that point, it worked out very well. Um, Dan Flynn, he was also at Berkeley. That was a little different aspect there. We had hosted over about 200 students there, um, protesting again, obviously, but they it was still a successful event because the students um, they were very happy with it, and he was very happy with it, and he was actually able to get his viewpoints out before the protest really kicked in. So look at it as a successful event in that capacity. Um, Oliver North spoke at Truman State University in Missouri. Had over 400 student, uh, people from the local community attend that event as well. So we, we are accomplishing these things, and the students are getting their, their names out there for their groups, and they're keeping their members involved. And that is it. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the breakfast. Thank you, Jamie. Now, those of you who are veterans of the Wednesday Wake Up Club breakfasts know that uh, we uh, try to always get somebody to introduce the speaker who is very close uh, to the speaker because we know that that is going to guarantee a good introduction and very often we are able to achieve a further incentive in the matter of having a good introduction uh, in a way that we have achieved today because to introduce our speaker we have Dan Koppelman who is currently legislative assistant to Tom Tancredo, meaning Tom hired him and determines how much his salary is. <laughs> that assures uh, a real effort at a good introduction. Um, uh, Dan handles for the congressman Social Security, health care, Medicare, Medicaid, welfare, housing, banking, small business, telecommunications, science and technology, and occasional introductions. Dan has worked for Congressman Tancredo since January of 1999, first as the computer system administrator and legislative correspondent. Um, Dan's been involved in local Colorado politics since 1994 on a variety of issue and candidate campaigns. He received his master's degree in computer information systems from the University of Denver in 92, his bachelor's degree from uh, in electronics engineering technology from DeVry Institute of Technology in Phoenix back in 1986. Dan Koppelman. Well, good morning. Um, by way of introducing uh, Tom Tancredo, I wanted to relay briefly a, a, one of my first memories of, of meeting him. Uh, he was, I was attending a 
a lecture, or I guess it was a round table type of conference on, on women and welfare. And it was about uh, right around 1993, 1994. Well, they had been going on about how many women they needed to bring into these, these social service programs and, and how dependent they were on them and, and how happy they were to, to see so many women being involved in, in these wonderful welfare programs. Well, I got up and asked a, a question and I, I was at the time thinking, you know, I'd just sort of try to raise a, a, a point. I, I asked, you know, how do you measure your success? Do you measure your success by the number of women that you've brought into this welfare system that, that you have dependent, or do you measure it by the number of women that you free from the, the need to be dependent on these programs? And, and I saw the biggest grin on Tom Tancredo's face when I asked that. And, and I, to be honest, I, I really don't remember the answer. I just remember the grin. And I thought, you know, this guy, this guy has the right answers because he knew where I was going with that. Congressman Tancredo uh, started with very humble beginnings. He started out uh, basically sweeping the grounds at uh, Elich, Elich's, which is a small uh, amusement park, extremely well known in Colorado. Uh, it's our, our own miniature version of uh, Six Flags, as it were. He moved up, uh, moved up the scale there into management ultimately, but uh, he, he did also teach uh, at Drake Junior High in Colorado. <coughs> From there, he became a state legislator uh, at the behest of the class. He was then, uh, after being reelected, he was then brought into the Reagan Department of Education, where he was the regional director in Colorado. <coughs> he, after serving a, an outstanding term there, uh, became part of the Independence Institute, where he was president. I believe starting in 1994, and was seen on uh, on many community broadcasts. Uh, about a year before his run for Congress, I recall being there and working on a on a project in conjunction with the institute, where he uh, offered me a position there. And at the time, I I had a job that paid rather well. <laughs> And uh, little did I know that he would ultimately offer me a, a, another job after winning his first election in 1998. And so I went ahead and took the pay cut and came out here to Washington, D.C. Uh, of course, we've remedied that. It's, it's doing fine. He won his re-election in 2000. Uh, is my friend and, uh, and my boss, Tom Tancredo. Thank you, Dan. Thank you all very much for having me here this morning. Nothing gets you excited about speaking to any sort of group uh, as when you're driving there and the, and the person who's taking you says, yeah, last week it was P.J. O'Rourke. <laughs> and the week before that it was Brent Bozell. Hmm. Gee, well, thank you all very much. I've had a nice time. I'm going home now. Uh, well, I have been around a while, as Dan indicates, uh, around uh, conservative politics for a long time, and certainly, I, and Morton and I were just trying to reminisce here and wondering, I, I remember the first time I, I met him, I know it was at his home, there was uh, some soiree there about 20 years ago, um, and I know that, that in, in again, trying to determine exactly how far back I go, I. I recognize the, the ties out there. You know, I have my Adam Smith's tie, but my Adam Smith tie is so old it is not on that, that uh, <laughs> board out there. It's, it predates all of that. So I have been around a while. And, uh, but being in, in the Congress of the United States has um, certainly been the pinnacle of my public activity, and it's an incredibly enjoyable. Most of the time, it is incredibly enjoyable. Some of the time it's challenging, some of the time it's a little bit dangerous. As when I was returning from the Republican National Convention 
in Pennsylvania, in, in Philadelphia. And the, it, was really, it was in the middle of the uh, United Airlines slowdown, you may recall. And we had just a horrible time trying to get out. And we finally, the, the plane left. It was about two and a half hours late. We had to circle a couple of times before we could get land in Denver. Anyway, we were landing in Denver five hours later, five hours later than we should have been landing. And as you know, all of you who have been on a plane at that time, tempers are short. Great deal of frustration. Plane lands. Everybody's just at the breaking point. Can't wait to get off this thing. Taxis up to the end of the runway. Up to, up to the gate, it stops, you know. And you know, again, if you've been there, you know exactly that feeling. You know that there's a problem when it stops at that point in time. You're not going to, and the, the pilot comes on and he said, I'm almost embarrassed to say this, but, and at that point in time, the whole plane just turns into this great moan, you know, oh, type of thing. He said, yeah, there's a, there's a plane at our gate. We won't be able to get there for a little bit. We'll have to sit here. And I mean, this, this place goes, wow. Well, we're sitting, my wife and I, we're back in steerage, in the, you know, the six across seating, and we're in the middle. And there is this guy next to my wife, big, hulking guy. And he's really, really mad. And he's yelling and screaming. And he says, uh, I'm sick of this. I've been on United Airlines so much. He's blah, blah, blah. You know, he says, and if there was any congressman on these planes, if they knew what was, if they had this ride in this stuff, and I'm going, yeah, let's find one, you know. <laughs> I'll bust one in the nose if I can get one. And boy, I'd like to just see a congressman around here, you know. Thinking, oh, brother. And, 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 but my dear wife goes, he's one. <laughs> and I said, I said, thanks a lot, you know. But the best part is this guy, <laughs> He looks over and he goes, nah. <laughs> yeah, nah. No, Congressman. I said, yeah, she's lying. But if I was the Congressman, why'd be sitting back here with you? Give me a break. So it can be somewhat challenging and, as I say, sometimes a little bit dangerous. But it is, uh, it's nonetheless been a great, great. Three years now, and uh, and the the best part of it, of course, is the last few months. Uh, somebody at the Denver Post called me up and said, "What do you think the biggest change is since you, uh, you know, now that uh, you've been able to go to the White House?" They know because I refused to go to the White House before. I was when I was first elected. I was asked by all of you know all the freshmen to go. Thirty nine members of the freshman class were all going to go to the White House. I didn't go, and really didn't make any big deal of it. I just didn't go. And the, and the press called me up, and they said. Um, well, 38 members of this freshman class went to the White House and met the president. And, uh, and I said, yeah. And they said, well, how come you didn't go? I said, I had a better offer. <laughs> I said, what was that? I said, dinner with my wife. And, and it was abs absolutely true. I wasn't kidding. Um, I, had, I was invited a couple of other times, and, and I just uh, chose not to go. Um, as I told the press then, I've been to the White House before when we had a, re when we had a real president. And so I... Uh, <laughs> wasn't inclined to go over there and 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 I I mean I did not want to, to get near this guy I mean quite frankly I'm not just the political side of it I just didn't want to get near him and I don't want anybody my my son daughter-in-law came out to visit us two years ago Easter right about this time our first grandchild now grandpa and grandma out there in the audience if you know what it's like number one first kid you know you turn into this mush ball I mean it is the craziest thing that ever happens in my life I don't know what happened I mean you know the old bumper sticker if I'd known grandchildren this much fun we'd have had them first well I guarantee you that it's accurate because uh, they're a lot more fun than your own kids because you can send them home <laughs> among other things but um, so so my I had my grandson out here and my son and they were going to go to the Easter egg roll at the White House you know, and I said uh, to him, I said, "Well, yeah, well, that'll be okay." Uh, and I called my son over and I said, "Now look, I want you to go. I want you to have a nice time and everything." But I said, "I'll tell you right now, if he comes out and if you let him get near this baby, I'm never going to invite you out here again." Well, I really didn't have to tell my son that. I should 
tell you, but I, I wanted to just warn him what the situation was. So anyway, they go off, they come back. That evening, I come home. Baby comes up to me. I said, did you have a good time today? And he says, yeah, Grandpa. He says, we did, but we left when that bad man came out. <laughs> you know, and in a way, I felt bad. I mean, I, I, it was kind of funny, but on the other hand, you don't want your, you know, your grandchild thinking of the President of the United States on that way. On the other hand, I just don't want him near him. I wouldn't want him near my grandchild. So anyway, the Denver Post called and said, well, you know, what's been the biggest difference between uh, now and before when you go to the White House, you know? And I said, well, first of all, now when I go over there, at least I don't have to wipe the doorknobs off with a handkerchief before I use them. Now, they haven't printed that yet, but it's somewhere waiting to be printed. I can guarantee you that. Uh, it will eventually show back, show up. Um, and, and so the last several months have been great. Uh, not only, of course, because uh, we have a new guy in town, but because I believe this new president has um, just the right stuff. In, in so many ways, and, um, and I think we will see it borne out time and time again. Um, the issue of education, it might be the one area in which I am a little concerned about the President's direction, and we'll talk about that in, in a short time, but I want to give you a tiny bit of background about how I got to where I am vis-a-vis -vis this issue of education. As Dan mentioned, I was a teacher. Uh, I uh, taught for eight years. About 1970. I read a book called Education by Choice, Two Men, Sugarman and Coons. They are both liberal Democrats, professors at uh, UCAL Berkeley. Um, and the book I, thought ha I found, however, to be quite compelling. And it was making a case for low-income students and the need for vouchers for them to equalize their educational experience. And as I sat there reading the book, I kept thinking about the fact that here I was sitting in a, in a public school in Jefferson County, Colorado. I'd just gotten that job a few years earlier. And I was looking around at all the people in my faculty lounge, thinking about all the students out there in the hall, the ones that I taught, and, I, and I, I thought about the fact that not one of us, not one single person in that building chose that place to be. Nobody picked that. I was hired by Jefferson County Schools and assigned to Drake. Every other teacher was assigned to Drake. The principal was assigned to Drake Junior High. All the students were assigned to Drake Junior High because they lived in that geographic, within the geographic boundary. Nobody picked it. And I wondered how much different it would be if we had all selected that place. All of us, teachers, principals, kids, parents, as the place we wanted to be because it was better for whatever purpose than anywhere else we could have been. And I thought about what kind of difference that would make in the culture of the school. How much different I myself would feel about it and the kids too. And I concluded that that was truly the best possible arrangement for American education. Well, it's gotten, my, my views have gotten a tiny bit more sophisticated on it, but it really goes back to that and to that book. It is an issue of choice and what happens when we pick the place we want to be, as opposed to when we are told where we have to be. So I set a course from that point on to try and advance that particular concept. And I did, in fact, twice put this on the ballot in Colorado, once in 1992, as I was the regional director of the U.S. Department of Education at the time, Don Sinise may recall some of the, some of the interesting developments uh, on that front, because I was off of the reservation most of the time, always with the issue of school choice and vouchers specifically, sometimes to the consternation of my boss, any one of the various four secretaries of education for whom I served throughout the Reagan and Bush administrations, who were lukewarm to passively supportive to mm, uh, pretty aggressively opposed to the whole idea of vouchers. But I was committed to it and made lots and lots of speeches about the, about the whole thing. And as I say, did put it on the ballot in 90, 1992 in Colorado. We have the initiative process there. Uh, it failed in 1998. I wrote another, it was a, this time a tuition tax credit proposal. And again it failed, but of course did better. And uh, we will eventually succeed. I am convinced that it will succeed because it has the power, well, put it this way. 
I believe that choice in education is a very powerful idea. I believe it is more powerful than all of the forces that are arrayed against it. And they are powerful forces, that's for sure. NEA, uh, not the least of which, um, is uh, uh, among those arrayed against it, and the AFT. But it will, I, I think, prevail, and you can see it already has. I looked at what happened when uh, Milwaukee was able to finally put through their first, put that crack in the dam. And I really think of Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and what happened there, the voucher plan there, if you can, it's analogous to, to D-Day plus maybe two, you know? D-Day plus two, everybody knew at that point in time, we had made the landing, we had made the inroad, the beach was secure, we were moving in, and in fact, everybody knew the outcome of the war. Both sides, really. Now, no one knew how long it was going to take, or how many bloody battles would have to be fought, but we all knew the end was in sight. That one event was the seminal event. That's the same thing as what I'm, I'm thinking is happening in the whole school choice battle throughout the United States. The, the Milwaukee experience uh, supported and defended by Clint Bollock, many of you know, uh, and probably should have here at some point in time. I think he's just one of the greatest guys that, and a true American hero. Uh, what he's done for school choice. At any rate, that is, we, we, we sort of know now what the end result will be. We will eventually be educating children in this country in, in ways far different than we try to educate them today. And I mean far different. And the reason why choice is so important, the reason why vouchers or something very similar to vouchers are so important is not just because it allows people to make the choice. I mean, so what? What's that's, that, that in and of itself is no big deal. What are the ramifications of choice? What happens if you allow people to actually use that, this, this thing called a voucher or an economic tool in the marketplace to obtain an education? Well, of course what happens is that you've got a lot of people then all of a sudden entering the marketplace as providers. And, and you have people saying, you know, I wonder, wonder, let's see, could we possibly make a buck? Could we possibly make a profit educating kids? Um, well, let's think of it this way. The average, I don't know what it is here in this, in this county, but in my, what's the average per pupil? $10,000. $10,000. Well, good. Nice round figure. That's going to help me out here. Uh, do you know what the average uh, student-teacher ratio is here? Anybody? This area? It's got to be around 20, 26 to 1? Okay, 26 to 1, 10,000 dollars. That means, then, that for every single classroom, every single classroom in this district, you have represented 260,000 dollars. 10,000 dollar average, 20, 26 to 1 uh, student-teacher ratio. Every classroom represents $260,000, which they, what is the average teacher salary? $40,000? Fine. That means there's $220,000 going somewhere else. And remember, we're not talking about buildings and maintenance. That's a whole different fund, right? So your overhead in personnel is $220,000. That's going simply, now if I were an entrepreneur, I'd say to myself, you know, I, I might figure out a way to make some money in this situation. Wouldn't you? And, and the first thing you do is you start thinking about what are the costs and what are the fixed costs? What's well, this building and well, what, what, can, what can I do? I think, I wonder what I can do to improve the efficiency of, the, of this building and the usage. Well, for one thing, would I, have, would I have it open only 164 days a year? Six hours a day? No, I don't think so. Another thing I think about is whether I'd use the building at all. Is that the way we should be educating? To, you know, I begin to think to myself, is it truly the only way we can educate children is to pile them in buses in the morning, ship them all over the place, bring them to a single spot, brick and mortar facility, bring in a lot of adults, put them together for six hours a day, send them home, and call that education? Is, is that really education? Well, of course not. That's the process. It's not education. Sometimes education happens in that process. Sometimes. 
Not all the time. And not very well. But it's what we constructed in America in order because we can we we constructed the whole idea of mass education during the industrial period. So we simply married those two concepts. How are we going to how are we going to educate everybody? I know. We'll build a factory. We'll bring them all in. We'll apply you know technology. We'll apply, we'll apply our resources to it. They'll go out this other side. They'll go out the assembly line. And you know what happened? Of course, is most of them fell off the assembly line. And so, but hey, that's another thing you have to remember. People keep talking about how, how great the good old days were in American public education and that things have really gone south. Frankly, my friends, the truth of the matter is it never was that good. Now, I know it's surprising to hear me say that, but listen to this. We have a, a strong desire on the part of the administration, all education uh, uh, wags, to reduce, to reduce the dropout rate. Now, let's define dropout. Right now, someone 19 years old who does not have a GED or a diploma. Okay, if you use that definition, the dropout rate in America today is about 24 percent. Some some groups, Hispanic groups especially, is much 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 higher. But nationally, about 24 percent. We are trying to get that down to 10 percent. That was one of the national goals. Remember, Don, uh, <laughs> when we were in the department, by the year 2000, we were going to make 10 percent. Uh, dropout rate. Well, of course, we never did, and, and we never will. And uh, but we are making progress. It is going down. Everybody says that's good. That's great. What was the dropout rate using exactly the same definition as I just gave you in 1950? 50 percent. In 1940, it was 60 percent. In 1930, it was 70 percent. Using the same definition as I've just given you. They, people did just exactly what my parents did at ninth and 11th grade, respectively. My mom and dad dropped out of school. My mom went to work for a place called Joslin's Department Store in downtown Denver on 16th and Curtis Street, and she worked there for 45 years as a clerk. My father drove a truck, went to work for a packing company, Armor Packing House, meat packing company. They did, he did that for his entire working life. They raised three kids. We had a nice little house in North Denver. We took a vacation every year to Colorado Springs, about 70 miles away. You know, we bought a car three or four years. We bought a, another car, not a new car, but a you know a different car. We had a nice life. To, sent three of us to college. There's no way that pe two people doing those two jobs today could ever do the same thing. We, there's absolutely no way, no matter how frugal you are, whatever. It's because the value of labor has changed dramatically. All that's done, gone, the past. Only thing has stayed the same is what? The educational system. Same system. That system worked before at 70% dropout rates. It didn't matter, of course. It did not matter. The economy grew because you went to farms and factories and you did not need it, a, an education. So everybody coming out, frankly, was kind of the cream of the crop, if you will. I mean, the people that actually made it through the whole system, that, that once it stayed, they were not the most difficult ones to teach. So we look back at the system and go, oh, how great that was. What a great job it did. Well, yeah, it did a good job, did a good job, because, frankly, it wasn't a tough job under those circumstances. Now we're smashing lots more kids into the system. We're now keeping 75% of them in school. <laughs> this is a much different situation than that old system based. The only thing different is, I mean, the only thing the problem is, the whole system hasn't changed. It's still the same system, trying to work with this new phenomenon. And it won't. It can't. So a, an education entrepreneur comes in and says, what can I do about this? How can I change this? What, what, how can I apply whatever I know and technology and everything else to this new you know, uh, dilemma or this new challenge? And I will not be the first one to tell you that I do not know every single way in which a child could be educated in America today. And I do not, and I will tell you another thing that I am very willing to admit to you 100%. I do not know, as a congressman of the United States, I do not know as a state legislator, I do not know as a school board member, what the best educational environment is for your child. I don't know it. And I will admit it freely. And that's what separates me, I think, from most of the people who serve in these positions. Because all the rest of them, or many of them, believe they do know what's best for your child. And you may not agree with them, but that's tough. 
because it's their job to make sure that, that your child gets educated in their system. It's a very elitist thing. You think about it. Even the school board, you know, we talk about this, and I've written a, a, an article, go on the um, uh, National Review website, uh, and uh, it's David Copel and I wrote an article uh, about the fact that we should abolish all school boards, local boards. That certainly will come up in my next campaign, I've no doubt. Um, but we should. There's absolutely no need for school boards. They serve. They have become puppets of the education establishment. And frankly, when when you talk about wanting local control, I'm all for local control. Absolutely, local. You. How much more local can I get than to give it to you, a parent, and and take me out of this equation? I I don't know what's the best, and I'm willing to admit it. And that's again, that's the thing that I think separates us. The other thing that separates us from, the, from people on the other side of the choice argument is this. Every, every single time, time and again, when you fight this argument out, you realize you're fighting for the kids, they're fighting for a system. Never fails. Never fails when you get to the bottom line on education. You're talking about saving kids, they're talking about the importance of the system. Well, you know what? I don't care. I don't care whether the kid is educated in PS 189, in St. Mary's Academy, or in a home school. I just emphasize the word educate. That's what I want. And I don't care where it happens. It's not up to me. It's not important to me. But they care a lot where it happens. <laughs> and don't let them give you this junk about, well, it takes all the best. You know, it's always great. I always say, you only need one word. You only need have to know one word in order to to win any argument on school choice. Only one word. Just use the word why. Here, here's the argument every time. I'm the defender of school choice. You're the opponent. You're the teacher's union person. So it always starts out like this. You say to me, you're not for vouchers, are you? And I say, yes, why? And you say, well, they're terrible. They're horrible. I say, really? Why? You say, because they'll ruin public schools. And I say, why? And you say, because everybody will leave. Really? Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Doesn't go any farther. Doesn't go any farther. So just remember the word, why. That's all you really have to know, and you can win any school choice argument I have, de I have determined. I tried to win them all the time, I mean, and I have spoken on this so many times, so many years, and they got me in so much trouble in the U.S. Department of Education that it kept my job there. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, I would speak on vouchers and on, the, on homeschooling and how wonderful it was. And at times, especially homeschooling, was thought of as so weird and cultish. And, you know, what is he talking about? And uh, there was a particular member of Congress. Her name is Pat Schroeder. <laughs> and uh, she was from Denver, of course. And, and um, I came into the Department of Education uh, you know, I got a call one day from somebody in the Reagan administration, and it was 1981, and they said, uh, your name has been given to us as someone who might want to serve in this administration. I said, really? Gee, wow, I'm, I'm so flattered. I'm, I'd been a Reagan, you know, I was a Reagan delegate and everything, but uh, I was serving in the Colorado legislature at the time. And on the Joint Budget Committee, which was a kick, I mean, that was terrific. I didn't, and they said, uh, I said, well, in what capacity? He said, well, the U.S. Department of Education. And I said, you got the wrong guy. I said, why? I said, because I don't believe we should have a U.S. Department of Education. And the guy goes, that's why we're calling you. <laughs> so, uh, so I said, well, well, specifically, where, where in the Department of Education? They said, well, out here, it's something. There's got to be some you know, undersecretary of one of I said, well, eh. I mean, I'm in the legislation. My wife's teaching. We got our kids in school. In those days, you couldn't get to give away a Mercedes with your house in order to get it sold. You may recall that. We're still suffering through the. the uh, uh, Carter year, Carter uh, recession. And uh, so I said, no, I, I, I don't think so. So they called back a couple of weeks later and said, look, how about these regional offices? You want to be ahead of a regional office? I said, the regional office of the U.S. Department of Education? Yeah. I said, I never heard of it. I said, I've been teaching all this time. I'm, I'm chairman of the Education Committee in the state legislature. I've never heard of the regional office. The guy goes, hey, we said, hey, 
Says, we send checks out two weeks, every two weeks. Somebody gets them. <laughs> Somebody's collecting them. I said, well, all right, I'll go take a look. I wander, I wander into the building, 19th and Stout, go up to the, to the 15th, 16th, and 17th floors where the U.S. Department of Education is ensconced. 222 people employed there. You notice I did not say working there. <laughs> I, uh, I couldn't believe it, you know, I mean, I'd go from place to place and, and I'd say, hello, what, I'm Tom Tancredo. So I took the job, by the way. <laughs> I, I said, I'm Tom Tancredo, because we're going to close this sector up, we're going to, this is going to be great, you know, and I, and, uh, what do you do? And I said, they'd always go, well, I'm a GS-12. And I said, well, what, what the hell is that? <laughs> what do you do? And they'd go, well, I'm an ed tech. And i say, now look, let's start from the beginning. You come in, you turn on the light. You sit down at your desk, then what happened? <laughs> That's the only way we're going to figure this out. Uh, and, uh, and it became apparent. Nothing! Nothing! <laughs> nothing happened! There was a lady! This is my friend. This is so incredible. Dottie, I remember. She said to me, she was the regional office librarian. I said, wow. I said, then what else? No, she's not the giant librarian, making $35,000 a year. This was 1980. Anyone? I said, uh, where's the this, where's the library? Should we just you passed it coming down? I said, I didn't see it. Regional <laughs> office library? And she says, Yeah. I said, Could you show me where it is? Said, she says, Sure. She gets up out of her own office, you know, separate office. We walk down the hall, I'm walking. She grabs my arm. This is here. I look. It's a magazine rack. <laughs> <laughs> And her job was to change the magazines, you know, when they came in. I said, who comes up here? Who checks anything out? Who in the world even would think, oh, I'm wondering by the federal office building. I wonder if there's a, a regional office library, <laughs> educational library. I can go look up a periodical. You know, nobody, nobody, nobody ever would come up there in a million years. And, 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 and nobody did. But she, that was her job, you know, it was her job. Oh, I could go on and on like that. Anyway, it took, took me about four years. We went from... 222 down to 60. Um, and as I say all the time, I used to give a speech all the time saying, now you know, we went from 222 to 60 in my, in my office, the regional office. That's an 80% reduction. Can anybody tell the difference? No one has ever, ever indicated that they have recognized some slowdown in activity you know, in the regional office. That's probably way back up now, I don't know. but, But, it was about 60-some when I left there. And, and one of the things that kept me there, I served both for Reagan and Bush, and the only reason I was able to do that is because this lady, Pat Schroeder, every, about every three or four months, she'd demand my ouster. Yeah. <laughs> and it, it turned out a big thing in the newspaper. Schroeder demands tank credit. He's, he's talking about vouchers. He's talking about homeschooling. He's giving the speeches over here. He's doing that. He's sending out stuff in penalty mail about vouchers. and, and uh, what we finally realized is, is that although there were plenty of people in the administration who would just as soon have me go, they were afraid of actually caving into her, making it look like they were you know, caving into Pat Schroeder. So she was my greatest security plug. It was wonderful. <laughs> so we got to the point, man, you know, it used to be we'd just send everything out and wait for some constituent to send it to her and her to complain. We'd just fax them right to her office. <laughs> <laughs> The next day, there it is. You know, hey, Tom, we're out here in 1984. I'll never forget. It. 1984, we're out here for the for the uh, second inaugural. It was so cold, you may remember that was so cold we couldn't do it. There were no events outside or anything. It was so cold, and we're uh, and Bill Armstrong's having a big soiree and for all the Colorado people, and we're there. And my wife and I are standing there, and somebody came up and said, uh, so, I, "So I made the front page of the Post today." And I said, "How'd you get the Denver Post here?" All right, and he said, oh, at "The Denver Post." <laughs> Washington Post. <laughs> I said, I did? Yeah. So we ran out and had to heat a quarter, you know, and put it in the sock. And, and pulled out, sure enough, front page, Pat Schroeder, the man's ouster, a regional representative, because he had sent out a car. Oh, it was, same old, it was just wonderful, you know. It was great. And then the last thing is is that upon the, the uh, collapse of the administration, here comes Bill, Bill Clinton in, of course, we're all, all getting wiped out, naturally. And... Uh, Forbes magazine calls me and says, we're doing an article and we're just doing some fact checking. I said, you know, something that is not done that often, I think. Uh, and they said, we, uh, we were told 
that uh, that the NEA went to the Clinton Gore team, transition team, and told them that the sun had better not set on inauguration day with Tom Tancredo still in office in Denver. I said, honest to God, that's the greatest thing I have. Is it true? And they said, well, we're checking with you. I said, well, how do I know? I don't know anything about it. Well, sure enough, they went back to NEA. They said, yeah, that is true. We really did. So they wrote it in the, in the article about, about the NEA. So I cut that out. And every time I'd speak anywhere, I said, what do you want me to say about you? I'd give this little, just this little word. Uh, the NEA demanded that I be gone, and by the way, I was, <laughs> by nightfall. Uh, which is okay with me. I mean, who in the world would want to be serving in, in that administration? But uh, uh, that was the greatest, greatest thing, and is still the greatest thing that's ever been said about me or my work. Uh, because uh, I, I do believe that they are the, our greatest nemesis. And education reform, and the fact that they thought I am, that's exactly where I want to be. So, um, I, the, the Bush plan brings us up to date here now. The, the Bush plan for education reform, it is uh, complex, it's over a thousand pages long, the bill. Uh, it's the reauthorization of uh, ESEA, Elementary and Secondary Education Act, plus a couple of other things. I'll just, the highlights are one, it, it does require. It mandates testing for all children. Now, this is the most controversial part of it. And I don't know that I can really eventually support this, I have to tell you. I guess, it, I, in one sense, if I trusted the system that more, I'd say, okay. But I, number one, I've never seen a test that the system couldn't cook the books on. And they do all the time. So I don't have any confidence in it. And plus, of course, you've got the problem of a national test being written when you get out beyond the math science part, especially into social studies, history, and the rest, being written in a way so as to push a particular uh, agenda. That's worrisome. But let me tell you how this bill gets to the point of mandating this. Because, you know, you can read the whole thing, and nowhere does it say all children have to take a test. Yet we know that that's what they're talking about. All children have to take a test. What they do is say, all Title I children, now, Title I, as you know, big, as you probably know, it's the biggest program federal government. We've spent over $180 billion on it. It's a complete and total waste. We have not improved the quality of education for one child in the entire Title I system. This is for under, I mean, this is for uh, underprivileged, essentially, low-income kids. That's what Title I is. So what, what they're saying is all Title I kids will have to be tested in at, at all grades, I mean, grades three through eight in, in areas of, of uh, math and reading. Um, well, it turns out, 1994, there was an amendment to the Title I law before I got here, and it was a response to something called Goals 2000. And it was a requirement that said you cannot give a, any test to a Title I student that is not given to all students. So, all you have to do now is say a Title I student has to have a certain test, and immediately all kids end up with the test. And that's the way this bill is written. Um, there is the issue of failing schools. There, there's two years that, that schools have to ramp up. There are three years they have to prove that they have. So that's five years, essentially, from the time this bill passes before anybody's going to see anything like a voucher if we get that part passed. And, the, and what it says is, after three years, if a school has failed, the kid can finally go take his Title I money, which may range between four and $1,600, someplace else, private school included. Now, there are other good parts of the bill, especially bilingual. I, I have also put on the ballot, attempted to put on the ballot, the elimination of bilingual education in Colorado with Linda Chavez. Um, with the Supreme Court threw us off the ballot last time. We're going to take another, another run at it this year. We have a parent approval thing in this bill. There, in, in the bill, I'm talking about the new uh, administration bill. So there are a lot of little parts in it that I like a lot. Even and the, and the, to be truthful with you, the voucher side of this thing it isn't significant enough to mean anything structurally. The importance of it is is almost entirely just uh, the show it creates. You know, I mean the the, the thought. The, the fact that we're pushing an idea, people getting used to the idea. That's why charter schools are important because people have to get used to the idea that there's a different way to educate children 
than just sending them down the street to the public school. Once they get, get that inculcated into their thinking, we can move ahead. So that's why I want that little charter thing in there. It isn't because I believe it's going to actually have some great impact. It's the thought that we want people working with. So it's a difficult one. I, I don't know what I'm going to do with this bill. There's going to be a lot of, of very serious soul searching by many of my colleagues, my more conservative colleagues. With that, I'll end it. And, and uh, we, are, we don't have time. I don't know. Do we have time for? I'm we sorry. Take a couple, but thank you. You bet. <laughs> I'm told the congressman has an appointment at 9.45, uh, Daniel, who has uh, passed me the note, uh, so that if somebody was going to stand up and give the hook to his boss, it wasn't going to be <laughs> Daniel. Uh, but we have time for maybe a couple of questions. Um, I'm from, formerly from Wisconsin, just three and a half years ago, and the voucher program was very much um, in the news, and we are a suburb of Milwaukee, and the the whole situation uh, got a lot of press nationally, but I think realistically, I'd like to make a date to talk with you, Tom, if I could. Sure. Because I think that uh, the, the Title I kids came out to the suburbs and the teachers couldn't teach. Could not teach because these kids were out of control. Yeah. So they babysat instead of teach. Uh -huh. The suburban kids were out in the tennis courts. These kids couldn't relate because they didn't play tennis. They were out in the alleys. You know, there's so much. Um, I have been made aware of a bill from um, Oklahoma town, and I think it's got a ballot thing going down here, and it's called the tax refund, a rebate kind of thing. And as grandparents, it really works out slick, and maybe we can talk about it, because it would give me the ability to support your children, not just a voucher for my son going to his children. And it's such a neat concept that if you hmm. aren't aware of it, and Tommy Thompson, I'm almost sorry he's out here. I really have a heartbreak. He's out here. Yeah. And um, I don't think he's a good man. He is a flip flop. He's no more pro life than my dog is. He's neutered. <laughs> you know, there's there's a lot to be said. He was a school teacher, but that doesn't give you the, the qualifications yeah. to really know what you're talking about. Right. He's a politician. Well, absolutely. I'd be happy to, to talk with you anytime. Well, Leah Cardin will try to arrange for, uh, you know, an opportunity that's mutually convenient. But I'll tell you that one of the great, I, I, another iteration of this whole idea is developing in, in Arizona. And it's, we're going to propose it here, by the way. I'm going to propose it as part of Bush's plan. I have no idea how successful I'll be. But it is, um, in Arizona, they allow you to contribute to a nonprofit, and it, whatever you contribute is, is, is a tax credit. Tax credit. If you contribute to a nonprofit that in turn provides support in the form of vouchers to students. And, and I, I love the idea. And it's, it's it already reached $14 million in this first year, and it's doing really well. So we're going to try that as part of the Bush plan. Yeah. One more. I'm, I'm a congressman. I'm a homeschooling father for the last five God bless years. you, buddy. And the, uh, a, tax, a voucher, I would not accept a voucher, but a tax credit, I think, is the right thing. I don't want any money back from the government that I've got to give to the government. Just save, me, have it. save me the problem yeah. of paying the money. Yeah, the I absolutely agree. I think that a tax credit is a better way to do it. It's a cleaner way to do it, and it, it lessens the ability of the government to tinker with it. But as I say all the time to, to people who have concerns about government encroachment, which are legitimate, believe me, I... I share your concerns about government encroachment into private education, especially with vouchers. There is, however, I, I, I just ask you to think about this. Remember, there is no voucher or tuition tax credit plan of which I'm aware that forces you to take it. It doesn't work for you. It doesn't work for your private school. It doesn't work for your home school. Don't take it. Nobody says you have to. On the other hand, would you vote against it because you don't want to take it? What about the rest of the world that it could, in fact, benefit? I mean, if you personally don't want it, that's okay. But is that a reason to not vote for it? Well, these no, these are refundable tax credits. And so you'll get it regardless of what you, regardless of what you pay. Anyway, Tom, I, I want to thank you so much. We're, we're so uh, proud of what you're doing. Tom and I have been friends for a long time. Uh, there was a big Republican primary when uh, 
uh, Tom uh, ran because it was a seat that a, that a lot of people wanted, and uh, I paid, I will have to tell you, very special attention to, to, to this race because I knew how good uh, Tom would be. Tom, I, I thank you, thank you, and two things, I want to give you your notebook back, and because that old Adam Smith pie that you had um, may have, uh, have, uh, have gotten a little thread there over time. Let me present you with Lee Smith, who's newest. I, I wanted to be catching a hit. <laughs> <laughs> and it is threadbare. Thank you very much. Great.